Mona El Tahawi is a columnist and commentator on Arab and Muslim issues. Born in Egypt, she's reported from across the Middle East as a journalist for the Reuters news agency. With some 60,000 followers on Twitter, Mona El Tahawi is a lecturer and researcher on the growing importance of social media in the Arab world. Currently based in New York, she's in Melbourne for the Writers' Festival. She joined me a short time ago. Mona El Tahawi, welcome to Late Line. Thanks for having me. How hopeful are you about the future of Libya after so many decades of Gaddafi rule? I'm incredibly optimistic for the Libyans. I mean, just the mere idea of Gaddafi not being there on September the 1st to commemorate his so-called 1969 revolution is just astounding. I don't think anyone could have imagined that the world's longest ruling dictator would be hiding out right now on the run from the real revolution. What do you think will happen to him? Of course, he's come out just today, apparently, in audio tapes and said he'll still fight to the end. Well, he seems to want that fight to the end. I mean, all the Libyans that I know and all the Libyans that I follow through various social media want justice to be served in the way that in Egypt we put Mubarak on trial, not for revenge, but for justice. But the way that he has been provoking and slaughtering people left, right and centre in Libya, he seems to really want that showdown to the end. There are still questions being asked about exactly who makes up the National Transitional Council and exactly who it is that the, the West has backed. What sort of government do you think is likely to emerge? Well, I think it should definitely be a government that represents all Libyans. I mean, I speak as an Egyptian who knows that there will be people in a future Egyptian government that uh, are not people that every Egyptian would like. But I think that the whole point of these revolutions and uprisings is that everybody in the country feels represented. And I think what gave me hope, especially in Libya, is when the revolution began in the eastern province, in Benghazi, you really had a sense of the people taking care of their own well-being. You had that presence outside of the courtroom where people were running schools for children, where people were running things like cleaning up after their various demonstrations. And I like to think that this will form the core of whatever future government for Libya uh, will, will come into being, in that everyone feels represented and everyone, everyone's voice is heard. I, I hope that optimism is well placed. Do you think it will be a secular government? Um, I don't know what kind of government it will be, because I think that when Libyans do eventually go to the polls, I, as, as I said, I want everyone's voice to be represented. And again, when I think of Egypt, I know that the Muslim Brotherhood, who is not secular, I mean, this is an opposition movement that is clearly not secular, I know that they will have a role to play in the Egyptian government, as they, sh as they should, because they do represent Egyptians. I identify as secular, but I understand that there are many Egyptians who don't. So I think as, as long as Libyans feel that they have a say in the kind of government that they have, and that government ensures the free and fair representation of all voices in the country, I think this is the kind of future that Libyans would want to have. You referred before to your, I guess, immersion in social media. What is the social media conversation like at the moment uh, between Libyans? What you're hearing between Libyans, especially those inside and outside of Libya, is, you know, after weeks of not being able to communicate because the internet was cut off, you know, on and off for, for several months, actually, you're hearing a great sense of excitement, a great sense of bewilderment that, that finally Gaddafi is on the run. But also this, this great, you know, it's time now to take our country in, 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 into our own hands. Gaddafi has left Libya, a very rich country, rich in its oil and its resources, essentially without anything. There are very few institutions and very little civil society to speak of. So the Libyans that I do follow through various social media are expressing this great concern of there's a lot of work to be done, there's a long road ahead, but they remain optimistic that they will be able to do all the work that needs to be done. And is there also a sense, though, of unity? Because, of course, I note that uh, the Western supporters of uh, the Libyan rebels have been meeting in Paris and they've certainly offered practical support, but they've also urged a path of reconciliation and forgiveness. We've got the US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, urging the rebels to beware of extremism. How united mm -hmm. post-rebellion are the Libyans? 
Well, you know, you hear from the Libyans, they recognize, for example, that many of the leaders of the Transitional National Council are people who defected from the Gaddafi regime. But you also hear this idea that there has to be forgiveness, there has to be reconciliation, and there has to be this conscious decision to move on and not to harp on, on whose side were you on in the past. Because in order for Libyans to rebuild their country, essentially build their country, because as I said, Gaddafi left them with very little, in order for that building of Libya to happen. Libyans do need to come together. But I think there is, across the entire region, not just in Libya, this amazing sense of optimism in that, look how much we've achieved. We have managed, in, in the case of Libya, they have managed to end a 42-year regime. And I think they're taking that excitement and saying things like, our imagination is free to go wherever we want it to be. So I think the last thing people want is this idea of revenge and let's get out there and make them pay for what they did. They want to look forward they want to move ahead and they want to build the country that they know they deserve. Where are the women in Libya? Because certainly in your country, in Egypt, there were plenty of women in uh, Tahrir Square. Very, very obvious. They were part of the protest movement and a very obvious part of the protest movement. But not in Libya, at least according to our television screens. The women in Libya were there very, very visibly at the beginning, because when you think about how this revolution started, it really was basically uh, women who were related to men killed in this prison massacre in 1996, the Abu Salim prison massacre. And it was actually the mother of an attorney who represented many of those victims' families who went out and demonstrated outside of the Benghazi courtroom back in February because the Gaddafi regime had arrested her son. So in a way, you can say that a woman inspired this very early start to the revolution because her son was detained. And you saw women very visibly in Benghazi and in the eastern province. I think where we began to see less women is when the, the revolution took a more militaristic turn, when it was more about young men standing up to the Gaddafi regime using whatever weapons they could find. In in that case, women were very much present in the backgrounds. You, you could hear of women who were involved in the various NGOs who were supporting Libyans uh, fighting for freedom inside and outside of Libya. But, but what, about in terms visibly... of, what about in terms of leadership roles now? How many women, for example, are there on the National Transitional Council? There's one woman I know of on the, on the Transitional National Council, and it definitely needs to be more. But I know that there was one woman who was a very visible spokesperson for them. She was one of two sisters who were very active in Benghazi and in the eastern province. So I think that the, there is a recognition that there are many qualified women out there, and they need to be more involved in the Transitional National Council. But from the Libyans that I follow, either you know, in the real world or in the virtual world online, I know that Libyan women will not be silenced and that they recognize they must have a role to play in the future of their country. How long do you think it will be until the countries that have been part of this Arab Spring actually have a female prime minister or a female president? I know in Egypt a woman is running for the presidency. What chance does she have? Right, we have a very popular television uh, uh, announcer rather called Buthena Kamil who is running for president. Um, Quite honestly, she doesn't stand a very big chance of becoming president, but I think it's much more important that she is running for president for the symbolism of it, to have a woman seriously contesting the presidency in post-Mubarak Egypt, I think sends out a wonderful message to young men and young women that this is a possibility now. And she is campaigning across the country. She is meeting with people in the north, in the south, in very, very conservative parts of Egypt. And I think what she's doing is something that all candidates in Egypt need to do, and that is being out there and saying, I demand a say in the future of my country. When it comes to other countries across the, the region, when you look at Tunisia, for example, they have this wonderful system set up in their constituent assembly and for their future um, elections, where the, the list, the electoral lists are basically man, woman, man, woman. And in that way, they, they ensure um, almost 50-50 representation for women. So every country is obviously going to handle this in a, in a different way. But I think as long as, as women are visible and as long as women demand to be visible, I think this will guarantee that the, the foundations of our countries in these post-dictatorships uh, will be ones that recognise gender equality. You've written in, in terms of Egypt that you've replaced Mubarak with a whole council of Mubaraks. Uh, are you comfortable or do you worry about the progress since the rebellion? 
Well, I think the revolution in Egypt continues. No Egyptian I know says the revolution is finished because to speak about the revolution in the past tense would essentially say that this military junta, this Supreme Council of Mubaraks, as I call them, um, has won. And one of, the, one of the biggest demands of the revolution was that Egypt becomes a civilian-controlled country. We've been under military rule since 1952. I remain optimistic because I think pessimism, again, would be an ally to these military rulers of Egypt. I remain optimistic because I know that all the progress we've made since Mubarak was forced to step down was progress that followed very, very strong pressure from the street. And next week in Egypt, September the 9th, Egyptians are going back to the street to remind the armed forces, to remind this military junta that this is a people's revolution and the, the people's revolution continues. If we look at other countries in the region, you talked about Tunisia, of course, Egypt and, and Libya. What about Syria, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia? Do you think there will come a day when they will really have their... Arab Spring? I am convinced that Bashar al-Assad's regime is finished. I think it's a matter of weeks, if, if not days. Because, you know, there was a stage during the various revolutions and uprisings where people said, well, seeing Mubarak on trial, we've put Mubarak on trial in Egypt, is just basically um, sending a message to these dictators to really crack down hard. And, and that's what Assad has basically been doing. But he has not broken the will of the people. They continue to go out. And despite these massive, the massive number of deaths that they've seen in Syria, they continue to stand up and say, we will not be bowed. And, and I think that is a message that continues to inspire others, others in the region. Bahrain, in, in Bahrain, they're, you know, they're, they're reinvigorating their uprising against the regime there. I mean, even in Saudi Arabia, a country that you don't think of as one that will be joining these revolutions or uprisings, the women there continue to take to their cars and, and this campaign called Women to Drive continues to be held in, in various cities. So I think what you're seeing, especially now that Gaddafi is on the run, is that an inspiration and basically a boost to these various revolutions revolutions and uprisings, and I'm, I'm confident that these will continue. Well, it's a certainly interesting times. Mona Al-Tahawi, many thanks for talking to Lateline tonight. Thanks for having me.